There's Matthew Broderick. He's pregnant. Workplace sexual harassment. Why don't we talk about it over dinner tonight? Your place. Olympic level diving. Some homage to Jurassic Park. And skin of the teeth escapes. It's 1998's Godzilla, but is it watchable? Thank you, canned applause, and welcome everybody to Is It Watchable? I'm your host, Paul. Better maximize your browser windows, because this is Giant Monster Week. The undisputed king, or maybe queen of all giant monsters, is the one and only Godzilla with over 30 movies under his belt. Since his introduction in 1954, he's done it all. He's been a bad guy, a good guy, he's destroyed Tokyo, New York, and San Francisco. He's had cartoons, comic books, and video games. And unfortunately to some, he's also become kind of a joke. When many people think of Godzilla, they think cheap special effects and poorly dubbed audio. And while yeah, there's been some pretty bad entries in that franchise, there's also been some pretty good ones. For proof, check out the very first Godzilla from 1954, directed by Ishiro Honda with groundbreaking effects by Eiji Tsuburaya. It effectively combined action, horror, and political elements all against a very topical nuclear age fear. The result was a very well-made and well-acted film that was just as much serious drama as it was creature feature. So surely with an obscene amount of cash, heavyweight director Roland Emmerich, star power for Matthew Broderick, and Jurassic Park level special effects, Hollywood could restore the good name of our favorite lizard monster. Or not. We open with an atomic bomb being tested in the Pacific Ocean. A bunch of lizards on a nearby island get disintegrated, but it looks like at least one of their eggs gets a Godzilla dose of radiation. Soon some strange things begin to happen. You see that? That was obviously Godzilla's tail. Now I'm trying to picture him swimming with those little arms and raising his big old booty out of the water to use his tail like a baseball bat. I don't think the physics work. Enter Nick Totopoulos, an American biologist studying radioactive worms in Chernobyl. The US government reassigns him to look into monster stuff including giant footprints in Panama and giant claw marks on a ship in Jamaica where they collect some radioactive samples leading to this Oscar winning delivery. Where's it been hiding the last 60 million years? What about the traces of radiation? The radiation isn't an anomaly, it's the clue. This animal is much too big to be some kind of lost dinosaur. But in contrast to that, we soon get a really effective scene that looks like it was lifted from an actual good movie. Well, back to the crap, because meanwhile in New York, we're introduced to plot padding characters like Audrey and her creepy boss. Are you serious? He's gonna consider me for the job? What else did he say? Well, uh, why don't we talk about it over dinner tonight? Your place. Mr. Kamen, you're married. Yes, and you're very beautiful. Have I ever told you that before? Mr. Kamen? Yikes, scenes like that make 1998 feel like it was 100 years ago. Next, we get our comedy relief characters in the way of Audrey's over-the-top New York friends, including Animal the Cameraman, played by Hank Azaria. Audrey sees Nick on TV teasing the obligatory love story subplot. Of course, our lovebirds will soon be reunited because Godzilla pops up in New York courtesy of a rom-com worthy meet cute. Now we get to sit back and watch some good old-fashioned rampaging. And honestly, these scenes look pretty good. Emmerich does do destruction well. Naturally, Animal the Cameraman has to run out to get the big shot. I guess that was supposed to be funny. Lost sight of it, sir. You want to run that by me again? This seems to happen a lot in giant monster movies. They inexplicably lose track of the monster. 
This is New York City, with millions of potential witnesses and countless law enforcement officials. And ain't no one seen nothing? Snitches get stitches, I guess. Meanwhile, Nick continues to haunt Audrey through the television as New York City is evacuated against some cool shots of Godzilla's aftermath. Of course, the evacuation doesn't sit well with the mayor because of reasons. Do you realize what this evacuation is going to cost the people of this city? We have been monitoring all the waters around the island, and as far as we can tell, this thing has not left the area. Yes, but you don't know for sure. We have a strong reason to believe it may be hiding inside one of the buildings within the restricted area. But you don't know for sure! Mr. Mayor! Ugh, he's like the mayor from Jaws, who is a good character in Jaws, but Hollywood really needs to put that character type to rest. Anyway, to find Godzilla, Nick comes up with a plan to lure him with some delicious, delicious fish. It works, and we get our first long look at our favorite movie monster, and he looks different than we remember. The military opens fire, and we get our second Godzilla rampage of the movie. And it's a doozy, showcasing Godzilla's mad speed, impressive hops, and I kid you not, sneaky hiding skills. Where can he be? Godzilla. Now I've got to admit, up to this point, the movie really isn't all that bad. If you were to catch the first half on TV, you'd probably be wondering why it gets such a bad rap. I think it's because it kind of ran out of movie. They managed to lose Godzilla again, so we need to fill some time between rampages with some relationship drama. The two go back to his tent where Nick discovers that Godzilla's pregnant. He leaves Audrey alone to snoop through his stuff. She finds a creepy shrine and a video cassette labeled Top Secret and decides to steal it. Like a complete bee, she leaks the video to further her career as a television journalist and Nick gets sent packing. But lucky for him, he immediately finds Godzilla hunting employment with the French Secret Service who are also secretly hunting Godzilla. They find Godzilla hiding in the subway and we get Rampage number 3. It's really more of the same except we're treated to a crazy shot of Godzilla straight up diving. So now the action takes us underwater where courtesy of some naval submarines we get our first fake ending. Of course the celebration is short lived because since Godzilla was pregger she laid some eggs using Madison Square Garden as her nest. And like eggs are wont to do, they hatch. The baby Godzilla's attack and we get some scenes that remind us a lot of the Jurassic Park Velociraptors. Apparently Audrey and Animal were secretly following Nick and the French guys and now they're all trapped in the garden. That's not good since fighter jets are on the way to blow up the arena and kill all the baby Godzillas. But they can't kill our heroes, so they escape just in time in one of those cliche explosions in the background, heroes in the foreground shots. Which brings us to fake ending number two. Hey, you can't keep a good monster down. I love this shot. Nick is all, oh my god, he's back! And Audrey's like, ugh, does this mean we get rampage number four? Yup it does, and this time it's personal because Godzilla's pissed that they killed all our youngins. What's interesting here is that earlier the military helicopter pilots were complaining that they couldn't keep up with Godzilla. Now Godzilla can't catch up with the New York City taxi. They decide to lead Godzilla to the Brooklyn Bridge, but remember, he's a sneaky one and somehow breaks up through the pavement and they roll right into his mouth. But the film can't kill our heroes, so they escape from one of those cliche- Okay, this one's pretty original. They drive out of his freaking mouth. Godzilla tries to give chase, but gets all tangled up in the bridge, making him a sitting duck for a couple of fighter jet missiles. Finally, Godzilla settles in for the eternal sleep, and our heroes live happily ever after. You know every time they get in an argument, he's going to bring up the time she stole that VHS tape. As I mentioned earlier, Godzilla was directed by disaster movie specialist Roland Emmerich, the same guy who pulled a fast one on us by making us think Independence Day was good based solely on the first 20 minutes. But come on, that scene where the White House explodes? That's practically worth the price of admission alone, but the rest of the movie just sort of meh. Godzilla sort of the same way here, except there's nothing even close to that White House scene to win at any points. But while Godzilla was a critical failure, it actually did okay at the box office. But how could it not? Anybody around in 1998 remembers the bazillion dollar marketing blitz. Godzilla was everywhere. He was in the toy section. He was in the freezer section. He was at Taco Bell. Godzilla's hiding and it's up to you to find him. Just buy a medium or larger drink. If you find a Godzilla, use your decoder to reveal what you want. Uh oh. I think I need a bigger bowl. Godzilla was nominated for a total of five golden raspberries and it took home two. One for worst supporting actress and one for worst remake or sequel. So Godzilla, is it watchable? Godzilla falls squarely in the so bad it's not that bad category. It's not good enough to be called an even halfway decent movie, but it's not bad enough to make it fun to watch either. The problem is that it's too competently made. 
The special effects aren't great, but they're passable. Same goes for the acting, writing, directing, and everything else. The movie plays more like a big miscalculation than a funny fail. There's no memorable bad dialogue, no memorable hokey effects, no memorable confusing plot points. It's just not memorable. So while yeah, it's watchable, you really shouldn't go out of your way. Well, that wraps up this episode. Be sure to join me next time when I review the 1953 science fiction classic, Robot Monster. And don't forget to subscribe.